Uh, my name is Murray Hebert. Uh, I work on the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS. On behalf of CSIS, we're pleased to invite all of you here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have, to have so many of you come. Uh, it looks like we're slightly overcrowded. Sorry about that. For, uh, for the discussion on Vietnam 20 years after normalization with the two ambassadors. Uh, ambassador um, Pham Quang Vinh is the new ambassador to Washington. He's been here uh, since uh, about the middle of last year. And uh, uh, previous to being, uh, being posted here, he was a, a deputy foreign minister responsible for, for a lot of Asia, but particularly Southeast Asia. And he's had previous postings in Bangkok and New York. And uh, on my uh, left is uh, Ambassador Ted Osius, who's been ambassador in Vietnam since, uh, since December. Uh, prior to going to Vietnam, he was the, uh, was a d uh, the deputy chief of mission in Indonesia. He's had various postings in Thailand and in and, uh, and, and India and other places in Asia. So uh, it's a delight. The ambassadors will each speak uh, briefly and from their point of view of where the last 20 years, where we've gone in the last 20 years in bilateral relations. And then we're going to open it up for questions from the floor. Um, what we're going to do is wait for a microphone and uh, identify yourself and uh, be brief. So, Ambassador Ving, please. So, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. And thank you, everybody. I'm very much honored to be here, Murray Hingbert, and thank you for the initiative. This is quite a rare chance, as I mentioned to Ted Osius, that the two ambassadors who is based in the different uh, capitals can be together and to share our thoughts on our relationship at this commemoration and also to share our thinking for the future. So it's very much uh, helpful that it, you can bring also the audience here that we can share with them. And to me, I think this year is very historic and, and unique that we uh, commemorate our 20 years of diplomatic relations. We have a long, a long way and uh, achieve a lot of progress. And this is to uh, commemorate the year to, uh, 1995 when President Clinton accompanied by the two famous statements, John Kerry and John McCain announced the normalization of our diplomatic relations. But we are here also to commemorate and celebrate the progress we achieved. I just want to mention some of the things that we have achieved together. Uh, let's say first, what has been so much did before between us? is a kind of the so-called symptom, the Vietnam symptom or the American symptom in each respective country. We can do together uh, form reconciliation to healing and also to partnership and cooperation. And the people-to-people -people exchange, including the veterans, has been coming together. They are sharing not only about the hard past, but also share about uh, what they can do together for the present and for the future, and a lot of things we can do together. And for us, Vietnam, we have learned that our full cooperation on the MIA issue, why the US has been working with Vietnam very actively on the world legacies, including cleaning up uh, the dioxin, the landmines, or the unexploded ordinances. All these have been our common efforts, and it's significant. We also have expanded our cooperation in a number of areas from economic to trade to investment to education to technology and others. And I think that the, the number of Vietnamese students in the US is uh, a figure that speaks for itself. We have before, around the time of 1995, about 800 students of Vietnam over here. But we have now, at the figures that I have got, uh, is about 16,500 students or so. Uh, this is the first among the Southeast Asian countries and the eighth across the globe. And this is significant for people-to-people -people exchange as well. And uh, 
Why we can't do that together? This is, we do it by hard work. And Ted and I very much often quote the same uh, observation by Secretary Kerry. Uh, no other two countries can work harder, can do so much and can do better as our two countries uh, to overcome the past and work for the future. This is what we have been doing. And I thank you for all of us, for the leaders, for the communities, for the business circles and all others who have helped our countries uh, to be together in partnership. And the second point I want to mention is that we have a strong partnership and we have a strong foundations to advance further forward. And uh, I can recall that the last month I presented my credentials to President Obama and he mentioned that this year is a unique opportunity for us to work together and to bring our relationship and partnership to a new high. And I think the word unique is very much important. 2015 is unique and historic. That's what we often mention. And we have a strong foundation because we have the comprehensive partnership that has been launched since July 2013 by President Obama and President Chiang Tan Sang. It covers a wide range of areas of our cooperation, from political to foreign affairs, to economic and trade, to education, technology, environment, and to security and defense, people to people exchange and all other, and many others. And we have been doing a lot, but I think uh, our cooperation potentials remain enormous and we can do a lot together. And Ted also has a very good uh, speech and remarks uh, in the Vietnam National University last month, I think. And he posed a lot of questions that we can do together and the answer is nothing is impossible. And all the points that we can do together can be made possible. And I have the same question as well that I must share with you here. Can we double our trade volume, for example, which stand now 36 billion US dollars? Uh, double that figure, maybe first one to 50 billion US dollars? I think we can do it. Can we work together to enhance further our cooperation in education, in technology, in uh, climate change and disaster relief, for example? Certainly we can do together. The number of students can be here more, uh, uh, can be here in a great number. And at the same time, we can facilitate the exchange of people to people, uh, contacts. And I remember that some half a million uh, exchange of people last year between our two countries and more can, can, can come as such. Can we do more? Uh, with the civil nuclear energy when we have the <coughs> agreement achieved last year, one, two, three agreement. I think companies like uh, Westinghouse has been there and other companies have been there also. Can we do more when the partial lifting of the legal weapon has achieved? Certainly we can do more, both from uh, capacity building to technology transfer and to human uh, resources building. All this we can do together, not to say the legal weapons. Can we do more at the regional level? I think we can do more. Uh, we can work together with ASEAN for peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. We can achieve with ASEAN for a, a regional architecture that is based on international law. We can do together to achieve maritime security and uh, address the challenges we face together like climate change, disaster relief, terrorism and others, we can do together. And very much strategically important is the TPP. Certainly we can do together. The government of Vietnam has a determination to work together with the US and other participating countries for the early conclusion of this one. It is hard work for us, certainly, but we have the determination and we need uh, uh, dialogue and consultation with all countries. 
and for us, Vietnam. This year also marks our three decades of renovation, and we have achieved a lot. And we have achieved a lot also uh, with regard to market-based economy. And this will help us to move further forward. But at the same time, it will be a more attractive uh, market for others. So uh, I want to stop here. And the conclusion is that this year is unique. And our relation has been going through a process of uh, significant change. And we have the strong foundation to move further forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ambassador Ving. Ambassador Osius, please. Thank you. Thanks, Murray. Uh, and it really is a pleasure to be on this stage with you, Ambassador Ving. I think I, if, you're, if you're waiting for a debate, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> Uh, because as I listen to Ambassador Ving, I, I, agree with, I agree with the vision that you have created. I think the right man is here at the right time with the right experience and energy to carry out this task. Um, as the Ambassador mentioned, this year is a really, really important one, the 20th anniversary. And so it seems to me that what I could do that might be complementary of what uh, Ambassador Ving has just laid out is to mention uh, a few areas, five areas, where I think we can use the opportunities of some high-level visits and focus on the relationship uh, to, move, to move forward in a number of key areas. And you, um, you've mentioned them, uh, so uh, the risk of running over some of the uh, areas that you've already mentioned, I'm going to uh, list them. Uh, trade, maritime security and defense cooperation, environment, science, technology, and health, education, and human rights. And so I thought I'd briefly go over uh, each of those. The, the, uh, uh, Murray and I participated in a conference in, mm. in January in which uh, Ambassador Ving's uh, good friend and, and colleague, Ha Kim Ngoc, mm. uh, opened the conference by saying, it's time for the United States and Vietnam to move past bilateral cooperation to regional and global cooperation. That's how we move the partnership to the next level. And he specified, particularly in the fields of nonproliferation, climate and water, food and energy security. And I think he's exactly right. So as I go over each of these areas where I think there's opportunities for us to do more and move the partnership forward, um, each one is keeping in mind the idea is to move this partnership beyond just bilateral to also uh, regional and, and global. So first is trade. Uh, as the uh, ambassador mentioned, tra uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership is a huge opportunity. It, it allows Vietnam to take the next logical step in its integration into the, local, into the global economy. It will create all kinds of opportunities for uh, for American and Vietnamese businesses and entrepreneurs. It opens new trade possibilities. It makes the goal that you just set of doubling our trade volume possible, I think. And it also includes strong legal, labor, and environmental protection uh, to support those possibilities. I think it will create jobs on both sides of the Pacific. So um, coming back to uh, what you said, can we do this? I think we can. I think we can complete the negotiations and make the TPP a reality this year. On, uh, in addition to the goal that you laid out uh, of doubling our trade volume, um, I think we can take steps this year that would permit direct flights between our two countries. And think about that. Think about the, how that opens the aperture. There are more business people traveling back and forth, more students, uh, more tourists. And that's easier if you can fly directly. Um, can the United States be? Vietnam's number one investor, as we are number one investor in, in ASEAN as a whole. And I think, yes, we can. And can Vietnam reform its visa laws to make it easier to do business in Vietnam? I think, yes, that is possible. Uh, Vice, the Vice Foreign Minister also urged us to, to work towards stable international systems and international laws. And of course, a high trade, a high standard trade and investment agreement contributes to that goal. But so does co 
collaboration in the defense and maritime security realm. I think our, our, uh, our goals align in many ways, uh, including in the South China Sea. Uh, Secretary Kerry said recently, we care deeply about the way countries behave in pursuing their claims. Intimidation, coercion, or use of force by any one of the claimants is unacceptable. I think we're in, a, in agreement on that. And we, we're making progress in all of the five agreed areas for defense cooperation, maritime security, high-level dialogue, search and rescue, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and peacekeeping operations. And if you think about it, the fact that um, Vietnam is now participating in international peacekeeping operations is part of what I think Vice Foreign Minister Ngoc was, was aiming at. We're not just doing things together, but we're working together on peacekeeping, and then we're going out in the world and making a difference. Uh, and uh, I think to continue to move forward in this area, the, the, the uh, maritime security and defense area, um, we're going to have to take some risks. This, because of our history, this area is a little less comfortable than some of the others. Um, but I think if we, we can do that, if we face our, pa our past squarely and honestly, uh, then I think we can look forward to a very different kind of a future. Do I think this can happen? Yes, I do. Uh, the third area I mentioned was energy, environment, science, technology, and health. And I think this is a great <coughs> example of where our collaboration, our bilateral collaboration, then can then be translated onto the international stage and can be an example for, for uh, other parts of the world. Uh, the ambassador mentioned the 123 agreement. That's, uh, I think, a great achievement of, of that science and technology relationship. I'm looking at someone who was there right at the beginning working on that science and technology relationship. And it, and it sets the stage for, for Vietnam to divor diversify its sources of energy um, and uh, creates a possibility for closer nuclear cooperation in the future. We're also working together on climate change, adaptation and mitigation. We have a, a forests and deltas program that helps Vietnam adapt to, to rising sea levels and to adopt more sustainable land use practices. We're working together on the ways that Vietnam will uh, act to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then through the Lower Mekong Initiative, which joins all of the countries of the Lower Mekong, um, we have an opportunity to collaborate on a number of issues, including water, which uh, the Vice Foreign Minister had mentioned. And the Recently, the Minister of Agriculture uh, proposed that we do some collaboration on food security and nutrition, especially in the Mekong Delta. And I mean, I think this is another thing where we can be ambitious. We can say, let's explore together Vietnam's vulnerability in food security due to climate change, what it means for Vietnam, what it means for the region, and what it means for the world, because Vietnam is a supplier, among other, to among other parts mm -hmm. of the world, to Africa. Uh, of its export rice. Health is another place where we have a rich tradition of collaboration. We've invested $700 million through the PEPFAR program uh, in, and uh, Vietnam has become a focus country for the President's global health security agenda. We work, <coughs> the CDC has been working closely with uh, Vietnam's Ministry of Health to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. And Vietnam has a good record in this area. It's dealt with SARS. It's dealt with avian flu. It's preparing for Ebola, which we hope won't make it to, to Vietnam. But this is another area where the spread of infectious disease matters not just to our two countries, but to the countries of the region and the countries of the world. And it's another area where I think we can collaborate. Education. Uh, you mentioned the very large number of students that are going back and forth between our two countries. The Fulbright Economic Teaching Program has a 20-year history of success in helping transform the way uh, economics and public policy is taught in Vietnam. And its 1,100 graduates are serving in provinces throughout Vietnam and making a, making a big difference. And it is going to morph into Fulbright University of Vietnam. It will be Vietnam's first private, not-for-profit university creating a transparently run academic meritocracy and an important platform for further, mm -hmm. further collaboration and for, for creating a basis for a long 
and successful partnership between our two countries. So that's another area where I ask, can we be partners in the area of education? Can we make a difference in our two countries and beyond? And I think that we can. Uh, the fifth and final area that I will touch on is human rights. I know it will be of interest to some members of this audience. Um, we, it's an area where we have seen some progress and we also uh, see some challenges. Uh, our annual human rights di dialogue has been very fruitful. The 19th will take place in Hanoi this spring. Vietnam has released a number of prisoners of conscience in the last 18 months. And I've been in and out of Vietnam for 20 years. I can see myself how much more space there is for religious, uh, religious expression than there was in the past. And there's some uh, increasing space for political expression as well. And in, the, in multilateral fora, such as the UN, um, we've been working together in ways that we never did in the past. And Vietnam has ratified uh, the Convention Against Torture and the Convention on Persons with Disabilities. Um, it has uh, modified laws to decriminalize same-sex marriage. And it's supported UN action to benefit LGBT persons worldwide. Uh, the United States believes that further civil and criminal code reform, uh, the development of an independent judiciary, and the protection and promotion of individual freedom will help Vietnam succeed and contribute to its economic prosperity. Uh, so I think there are a lot of areas where there's potential for us to do a lot together. I agree with him, uh, Ambassador Vinh. Um, there's tremendous opportunities this year in particular with the kind of visits that will take place. Um, Vietnam has changed so much since I was first there 20 years ago. And when I look at what's coming up, the next chapters, I'm very excited about the possibilities. And I'm glad to have such a great partner as Ambassador Vin in this endeavor. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ambassador Osis. So uh, thank you very much. Maybe before I open the floor, I'd like to ask a question um, from the, using the moderator's prerogative. I, um, you've both listed uh, a number of uh, areas in which you see potential for, for Im improving relations over the next few years. Could I just ask you both to, to maybe tell us one or two areas that you see are just really very difficult uh, to try to tackle? You know, I think Vietnam probably has its difficult issues and the U.S. has its difficult issues. Ambassador Ving? Is, or do you uh, want to let Ambassador Joseph uh, come <laughs> You enumerate a lot of areas. <laughs> well, I don't think human right, the human rights issue is easy to handle at all. And I think, I mean, the fact that we've seen some progress is fantastic, and I think it, there really has been progress, and it's important to mark it. But I don't, you know, I don't pretend it's all done. I don't pretend we mm. we ag agree uh, on, on everything. We on some very important issues in the UN. We don't vote the same way. We don't see all these issues the same way. But I think the only way to make progress is to keep talking, and to continue the dialogue, and to see where there's where it's possible to expand the areas of collaboration. And then when we come up against something where we really, we really have serious fundamental differences, at least there's a basis for dialogue and we can see if there's some way to negotiate a way forward. So I think that's, a, I don't, I think that's a, probably the toughest area. To me, I, I think that no two countries are identical. And in the comprehensive partnership, we share also that we should appreciate uh, the traditions and the political system, the independence of each other. So I find that in every area of our cooperation, we have similarities and differences. And for example, in the past, we have taken a very hard job to overcome the legacies of the world. And now today, we expand, as we expand further our cooperations, and in every area, we see differences and similarities. But the one thing is that I do agree with Ambassador Ted Osius that we have a dialogue, we have consultations, we understand more each other, and we find the conversion of strategic interests, and we can do together. And certainly, we have the wish also to do together. So I think we have a good foundation for that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to open questions, two questions from the floor. Uh, there's a, a somebody, people with microphones scattered about. If you have a question, raise your hand, uh, identify yourself, please, and then uh, 
please keep your statement short, because we are probably going to have a lot of people ask, ask, want to ask questions. Uh, and, and end with a question, if that's possible, hand, or here. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Scott Tavari with Asia Tactic LLC. And my question for Ambassador Vin is, what do you feel is uh, in Vietnam's next uh, interest in terms of uh, environmental and scientific exchange uh, to expand that relationship that the two of you had discussed earlier? Thank you. Can we take a few questions? You want to take a few? Okay, we're going to take two at a time. Over here. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Adam B. Sudi. I'm with Politico. I had a question about Vietnam's involvement in TPP. Um, to what extent, I know there's, there's a, a work plan the U.S. and Vietnam are working on regards to labor standards and oblig uh, obligations in the agreement on labor uh, rights. Uh, can you explain sort of what Vietnam is looking for in a transition to transition their laws to comply with the TPP labor rules and, uh, for example, um, the right to organize, will that, will that be addressed uh, in some way through TPP? Thank you. Okay, should we do it? Thank you very much. First, on, on environment, right? Technology, I, right. Environmental technology and also environment. First, on environment, uh, we have a law on that. We are more aware of the need to protect environment, and certainly the question of climate change have a, uh, have a, uh, affected us a lot, especially in the South. And for the technology, we try, and we have a law for that, and we try very hard to improve the industries and, and the products for, for that one. Uh, try to have better standards on environmentally sound technologies and, and products as well, including automobiles. We have the standard for that. So we will hang up for that. Certainly, in, in the meantime, we have to com compromise between our expectations for uh, and also our immediate needs for now to take care of the welfare and the growth of other people and the growth of economy. But we are determined to have, uh, to work for in environmentally sound uh, technology workplace and uh, products as well. And on the TPP, I think uh, the question is not just for Vietnam, for everything. The process of negotiations among the trial participation countries are going on. And I think market access is, not, is some important thing, but not just that one. Other standards need to be negotiated as well. And we know that there are high standards on both trade and trade-related issues, and we are happy with that. You mentioned about uh, labor. Labor is one part of the negotiations. So every country needs to have some concessions here, some benefits over there, and the harmonization of interest will be uh, the one that we will conclude later on. But we will work hard for that. We uh, have our system, and we have a trade union also. Certainly, some, some, somebody can complain here and there that your trade system, your trade union system is not like us. And we may also often uh, hurt other views as well. So this is the way that how we can do it uh, suitably and better for our people and for the country. But the negotiations is not just on market access, but on other things as well. Uh, very much comprehensive and high standards. But all of us have a benefit, and all of us have to do something for the better. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like the way uh, Ambassador Ving put it. On, on TPP, I think that was that's that's spot on. I was the labor attaché when I first went to Vietnam to serve there 20 years ago, mm. and I can tell you, it, to me, it's phenomenal to see what is on the table in the TPP discussions. Phenomenal, and uh, I think we have there's an extraordinary opportunity with TPP uh, to bring about some of the changes that I think Vietnam wants to see anyway uh, occur in its economic system and, its, and in its labor arrangements. Um, so those of, you know, those of you who, who uh, there, are people, there are a lot of people in Washington who say, oh, you know, TPP is going to lower labor standards, this and that. <laughs> no, 
it's not. And in a place like Vietnam, it's, it's phenomenal, uh, the changes that become possible as a result of Vietnam being part of this high standard trade agreement. Now, Vietnam, as the country with the, uh, the uh, least developed country uh, member of the, of the negotiations, stands to benefit economically the most. This is a good thing. This is a good thing because uh, it also, the Vietnamese leadership, and I've been struck by this since I arrived, is absolutely committed to completing the TPP negotiations and going forward and implementing the agreements uh, under TPP. So I think it's a very good story. And I just wanted to add one thing on environment. Uh, together, the US and Vietnam have been uh, working on illegal wildlife trafficking. Hmm. And some people may not get excited about that. I do. Um, I think it's a, an important issue. And it's another one of those areas where it's not just bilateral cooperation, but we learn through it because these, these matters don't respect these issues don't respect borders. Trafficking of all kinds does not respect borders. And so what it means is not only the United States and Vietnam work together on illegal wildlife trafficking and other illegal kinds of trafficking, but we work with Vietnam's neighbors and, uh, with, uh, and beyond. So it's another one of those areas where I think we're, we're taking our bilateral collaboration and moving the partnership to the we next level. We have level. project for the LMI, the Mekong region as well. Yeah, exactly. The LMI mm -hmm is another area where we're showing the way the water resources management. environmental protection healthcare and yes assets. yes jim um, jim kelman a retired uh, state department public diplomacy officer now i run something called the washington international exchange center first of all thank you both ambassadors for coming here and allowing we members of the general public to hear your vision, which in many ways is a joint vision. Um, both of you mentioned people-to-people -people exchanges as an important element of the relationship, and I would like to hear just a little bit more elaboration uh, from both of you on what your vision is on, on that and where we can hope to go. Thank you. David? Thank you very much, uh, David Brunstrom from, from Reuters. Uh, I was wondering if I could uh, ask about uh, the issue of uh, <clears throat> Russian air activity out of Kamran Bay. It's obviously been in, in, in news quite a bit in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, um, how has Vietnam responded to the US concerns about refueling flights for strategic bombers out of the base, and, and are these still going on? And um, if so, could there be any implications in terms of a further um, lifting of the UN, U.S. arms embargo? Thank you. One of you want to take on? Can you start with sure. people to people? People to people. Um, one of the reasons I get excited about the idea of direct flights is because it opens the aperture for what you're talking about, uh, for more exchanges between business people and tourists uh, and uh, you know, and the expat community, the Vietnamese expat community, who, those who want to to visit Vietnam. Um, I think that's the other reason. I think visas are really important, and having a, a, a as liberal possible a visa uh, regime, because you want we want to have those exchanges. Those are the basis of a successful partnership. In fact, long before we had normalized relations. It was in, you know, in the areas of education, in the areas of people-to-people -people exchange, the progress was made always ahead of our governments. That's the, the I, I think that people have already moved, always moved faster than governments have in this relationship. And I believe there's enormous asset in the, the Americans of Vietnamese origin community in this country because there are a lot of people who are doing very well, more than two million people in this country who are doing very well, who are interested in what's happening across the Pacific, uh, and who have contributions that they may wish to make. So I see that uh, as something that was, uh, we have a complex history. I'm not, I don't have rose-colored glasses about that. It's going to be very difficult for some people to look at it this way. But the younger generation in particular looks at Vietnam as a place where there are great opportunities. You mentioned internships when we were out in the hall. That is such that makes so much sense to have young Vietnamese <coughs> intern in American companies or to have Americans intern 
in, in Vietnamese companies so that we get to, to know each other better because that's the basis for uh, a long-lasting partnership. Um, on Cameron Bay, um, first, I think there are just two, two important points to make. One is that from my perspective, and uh, I'll be very interested to hear what Ambassador Vin says, uh, one is the United States respects the arrangements that Vietnam has with other countries. Uh, those we're, we're very re respectful, um, understand that there are traditional relationships that are long-lasting, and uh, who are we to instruct Vietnam on, on uh, what kind of relationships it wants to have? We celebrate the good Vietnam, the good relations Vietnam has with other countries. And the second point is that on in this particular instance, we think the Russians put the Vietnamese in an awkward position by using their arrangement and, and then uh, engaging in some provocative acts. So I would say the, the fault here lies with those who took advantage uh, of uh, uh, an arrangement that we respect. Uh, first on the people to people exchange, I think uh, I share a lot with uh, Ambassador Ted Osius. Uh, to me, I think that uh, for the general public, the government and the environment we should promote for the people to come back and forth, both sides. Uh, how can we achieve that? That is the relationship of ours. And a lot of incentives that uh, need to be promoted and advertised so that the US is a good place, Vietnam is a good place for people to go and back and forth. And we have a lot together as well, educational purposes and the companies we have a lot of U.S. companies working in Vietnam, and that is a source of uh, encouragement for people-to-people -people exchange as well. Education is another point, and you mentioned very correctly about the uh, direct flight between our two countries. That means have a lot, but we can do more together, I think, because uh, Vietnam should be considered by both uh, countries as a place for tourism, for business, or others, or the U.S. can be a place for business, for education, and others, rather than the place of war. That uh, has been considered some for 40 decades ago. So a lot of things we can do together, but suddenly we need uh, to go to the grassroots and, and, and for their job, whether for their interests as well, not just at the government and the elite level. And on the question of the, the Russian uh, airplanes and, and also the Cameron Bay, the first thing I want to mention here is that the policies of government of Vietnam, and Ted Osios has mentioned it very correctly, that we have an independent policy of our foreign relations. And we will not let our relations with any countries that will be harmful to a third party or a third country. That is the policy of friendship and partnership to all countries. And I thank you, Ted Osias, for mentioning that you respect that one. And on the very instance that you mentioned, uh, we open our facilities for all countries for services, logistics. And it's not presumed to be harmful to any others. And we ha have no information on this one. So that's why this we have been discussed uh, between ourselves and, and the U.S. officials as well. A clear understanding has been made. And I must say that uh, our airport, our place, and our arrangements with any others will never be harmful to a third country. And this is an independent uh, foreign policy. And the incidents is presumed to be uh, in that context as well. So we have a lot of things to do together. Uh, and I think that the, between us, Vietnam and the U.S., we have uh, working together in the context of a larger international community as well. And we have been doing good between us and together with other countries. Um, did you have a question yet? Uh, somebody already. Oh, okay. Okay. Please keep it short. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Very happy, but uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador Phong Quang Vinh and Mr. Ambassador Ted Osias. I am Dr. Kuya Vu. 
political prisoner of uh, Vietnamese government. And uh, I uh, thank to uh, international uh, and especially American intervention. Okay, I have, I question, have been uh, uh, released uh, direct, uh, from Vietnamese prison. And now I'm here uh, just uh, to uh, cooperate uh, with all of you to promote relationship between the United States and uh, Vietnam. Um, uh, my, my question is very, very brief. Um, um, uh, um, Mr. Favkovin uh, said that yeah, that there are um, uh, differences between the United States and uh, Vietnam. That's the normal. Uh, that's the very, no, very normal in international relations. But I think uh, about uh, uh, the question of human rights. For example, uh, both countries must work on a common base. For, for example. Uh, uh, the de uh, United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. So, do you or, have a question? Yeah. We need to so, have a question, sir. So, so I uh, think that Vietnamese government uh, cannot uh, continue to say that uh, uh, Vietnamese government uh, has uh, its own policy on human rights. Human rights of every country, including Vietnam, must be based on uh, uh, international law on human rights. For example, declare, uh, United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. Sir, do you have yeah. a question? And so, I'm sorry. And uh, my question is, is, is um, um, I, would, uh, I would like Mr. Kwang-Ving uh, uh, let me know if uh, uh, in the near future uh, Vietnamese government uh, can stop uh, repressing uh, dissidents in Vietnam and stopping to use uh, uh, prisoners of conscience or dissidents uh, imprisoned as a community to exchange with uh, Western countries, especially Western countries and okay. uh, the United Thank States. You. Thank you. We got yeah. your question. For Thanks. benefit, uh, uh, economic benefit or military assistance. Thank you. Uh, Thank Home, you. do you have a question? Nguyen and Peng Hong from George Mason University. Um, thank you both for sharing your thought with us. I have two brief questions. One for Ambassador um, uh, Osius. My question is, what prevents the United States from recognizing Vietnam as a market economy? For Ambassador Ving, my question focuses on security and defense relationships. Uh, the question is, what is your vision of the ultimate goal or desired destination of that security cooperation between the two countries? Thank you. On the question of how we can work together in the field of uh, defense and security, I think we have a share a lot, and it has been uh, recognized in the comprehensive uh, comprehensive uh, partnership that we work together for the benefits of our two countries. We can be stronger, more independent, but at the same time uh, for peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. And I can give you a number of examples that we can work together, uh, such as we work within the context of ASEAN-related process for the regional architecture that can uh, ensure a better environment for peace, security, including maritime security, and prosperity for the region. And my understanding of security includes also, uh, in a more comprehensive manner, includes also uh, non-traditional security like uh, disaster, like climate change or terrorism. <coughs> so we do a lot together, but at the same time, uh, do it bilaterally and uh, regionally and globally as well. We have a lot of things we can do together. And I think the recent announced project by uh, Secretary uh, Kerry for the strengthening of uh, the coast, uh, coast Guard capacity of Vietnam is very much important as well. We are working on that and the process is uh, going smoothly and we uh, 
have a capacity building uh, cooperation as well. That is good. And I must say in all other fields, on the question of human rights, I must say that the law in Vietnam protects, and we have been parties to uh, international conference, and is this one. And I will reject that we have any prisoner of uh, concerns or any of that. But with the US, we have a dialogue with the US on human rights, and uh, we have fruitful exchange of views. We have differences, of course, but we have more understanding when we have dialogue and consultations. We have been parties to uh, most of the core international human rights bills. And if you compare the countries in, in, Viet, uh, in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, for example, Vietnam was among the countries that have been to most of the core human rights uh, conventions. And what is the most important thing is that we have to do it good for individuals and communities as well. And the law is there and it should be protected under the law. And everybody is equal before the law. And uh, with regard to other countries, we have uh, projects as well, not only the, the US, we have dialogue with Australia and uh, the EU, for example. It has been a good way of uh, doing things to work together for the welfare of the people at, at the same time for better mutual understanding. Um, I know the question about security cooperation was in, addressed to Ambassador Vin, but I just want to endorse what the ambassador said, that it's not just traditional security, but also non-traditional security concerns that require our attention and require our collaboration. Um, on market economy status, there are six statutory requirements to, that have to be met for, mar for market, economy, market economy status to be achieved under under our laws, it's a not a political process. It's a very open, transparent process run by the Department of Commerce. Um, we have a mechanism in place for dialogue about what steps are needed for, for Vietnam to achieve market economy status. It's my belief that TPP and completing the TPP process is going to be very, very helpful uh, in this in As I said, as well. Yeah. And also, mm -hmm. but also one of the provisions is uh, convertibility of currency. So not all of the six requirements have been met yet. And as I said, it's not a political process. It has to be done in a ver uh, very strict way in, in accordance with the law. And we're not there yet. But do I think we can get there? Yes, I think, I think it's possible. Uh, but steps still have to be, to be made. Um, on human rights, uh, Murray asked what did I think was the hardest part. Uh, uh, and I do think that's the hardest part because we don't agree uh, on everything when it comes to uh, matters of human rights. But I do not think our relationship can achieve its fullest potential until there's continued significant demonstrable progress on human rights. And right now, the focus of our joint activity is what Vietnam is doing to modify its civil and criminal codes to make them consistent with the Constitution. There is uh, recognition that not, not all of those statutes, not all of those uh, security uh, provisions are consistent with the, with the Constitution. And uh, we are working with the Ministry of Justice. Uh, we have a new resident uh, legal advisor who's, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a dialogue going on about how those codes can be revised. Uh, it's my belief that it would be, it would be great if, uh, while that revision is going on, if Vietnam were to impose a moratorium or freeze on, on further arrests that are uh, based on some of those provisions that are very, very controversial. Uh, I don't know uh, that, that we're going to come to agreement on that. But we have this vibrant dialogue that I believe is bearing fruit. Uh, so bear with us. We're going to make progress in this area. Sorry. I think on the question of, uh, of the market economic status, we can do together. Vietnam has been doing with other countries, and I think about three dozen or something countries have recognized that certainly different countries have different categories to be discussed. But I have the same thinking with Ambassador Ted Osiel said. When we reach the conclusion of the TPP, then everything satisfactory 
uh, there to be uh, uh, resolved. And uh, Almost. we are working Almost. for that. We are working for that. <laughs> we are working for that. So back, back here, right straight down the middle. Uh, thank you. I'm Ryan Rainey from Inside US Trade. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Ambassador Vin about uh, Congress, the US Congress. There's been a little bit of a holdup in introducing a trade promotion authority bill. Um, I wanted to see if you think that that delay could lead possibly to a stalled TPP. Um, and also, just on that note, and Adam alluded to this in his question, on labor, the, the, the labor negotiations in TPP with Vietnam have become an issue that a lot of members of Congress have had questions about. I wanted to see if you and your role have been engaging with members of Congress to uh, reassure them as, as you did uh, just, just now. Thank you. And Mark Mannion. Hi, Mark Mannion from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, thank you. Thanks to you both uh, for coming here today. Um, last year, as I think everyone in this room knows, the U.S. Uh, the Obama administration relaxed uh, restrictions on sales of uh, lethal weapons uh, systems. And I'm wondering, so far, what uh, contracts have been made or are being negotiated on, along that front, and uh, what types of expansion, uh, or what other types of sales, what other types of systems do you anticipate, and do you anticipate any further uh, relaxations uh, in the coming months? I think the first question on the TPA, it should be Ambassador Terosius <laughs> to answer to that. <laughs> but uh, we have the group of uh, TPP ambassadors based in Washington, D.C. We often talk with each other. I think that if the TPP is achieved by the administration, that would be very much helpful for the U.S. administration in their negotiations. But for us, Vietnam, we think that will be a facilitator as well. But it's not quite uh, a condition for the TPP negotiations. What are on the table for the negotiation in the process of, of, of TPP drafting that is very much important as well. We have been uh, discussing a lot of areas, including trade, market access, labor, and others. And I think I, I, I have uh, explained a little bit about labor already. But my point is that, that the TPP is so much comprehensive and high standards. And uh, it covers everything. And the discussions are going on. We hope to achieve the early conclusion of that. Vietnam is determined for that. But once you settle everything, then everything will be the TPP rather than pick up one or the others. And I think that every country in the process of negotiations for the TPP will have a problem. Some have a milk, some have beef, some have others. And so it will be also the question of concern, not only for the Congress here in the US, with a question of concern for the community and the parliament in Vietnam as well. They asked the government to clarify whether we have good TPP or not. So I think the good TPP is good for participating country and for all the countries in the process. Thank you. On uh, Mark's question, um, that we, the United States actually recently provided some fast patrol boats to Vietnam for use in maritime security. I think that was made easier uh, by the partial lifting of the lethal weapons ban. I think actually some very significant opportunities now exist for, uh, for sale and transfer uh, uh, of some, some capabilities to Vietnam, but no, not yet. There haven't been contracts signed yet. Part of it is that our processes for approving and, and uh, approving weapons sales to Vietnam are ones with which the Vietnamese are not yet familiar. Uh, they have some very traditional relationships uh, that they're quite familiar with, and we're new. Uh, so this isn't going to happen really, really fast. I think this is going to be this is going to be something that will happen gradually. And as to the sort of hypothetical question, when will there be a complete lifting? 
Uh, that really does depend on further progress on the area that I think some of us agree is the toughest one, uh, further progress on human rights. I really intend to, to have Ted to uh, raise the issue about the possible lifting of the new weapons uh, ban, uh, just because he will know more uh, the programs here in, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Actually, I think that the, it is good signs that the two countries have uh, that achievement. And for us, Vietnam, we won uh, the, 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 the total lifting of the ban, certainly. It has political symbolic as well. This year is the 20th anniversary of our diplomatic relations. So everything should be normalized, including this one. That is the, the, the symbolic issue as well. Now, coming to the contrast, you mean something more substantive uh, implementation of, of this one. I think, number one, we have to identify the systems, the process as you were just mentioned. Number two, you have to identify the needs of both sides, whether we need something and you can provide something, or whether uh, uh, we can do together on this one. But the third point is that I think we are in a process of discussing to know each other, to understand more each other. But for this one, even with the total lifting of the legal weapon ban, it will be our policy of, uh, uh, of uh, defensive nature of our, our army. That is uh, the, the, the very basic question here. So I think the, the package for the Coast Guard uh, capability building is along that, these lines, and we are doing with that. Let's do it with this thing and why we are discussing others. And I heard last time I was at CSAS, I heard a proposal that, I re that really appealed to me. Mm. You know that um, you know, all of our weapons procurement systems are complicated, EDF and this and mm. that. And when I was last here, I heard the idea that CSIS might uh, host uh, a roundtable discussion in which these, uh, off the record, these kinds of weapons procurement systems could be ab explored um, in, a, in a very uh, no holds barred way. I think it's a terrific idea because really our weapons procurement systems are very confusing. And laying it out, having that uh, frank discussion in a place like this um, where it's not official, I think would be terrific, very useful. Great. I, unfortunately, I think we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, we want to thank uh, both Ambassador Ving and Ambassador Osius for, for graciously coming here today. I know Ambassador Osius has had to come the longest way. Ambassador mm -hmm. Ving is very lucky. Usually it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. But uh, please join me in thanking them for, for coming and for the candid conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much.